Dave McGowan coming back on the show. Big, uh, big, uh, everybody loves good old Dave McGowan, uh, from, uh, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. He's going to be coming on talking, we're going to be talking about the moon landing. Was the moon landing a hoax or not? Okay. So that's the next couple of weeks coming up. Um, but tonight we have Katie Beers. Uh, Katie, are you there? I am. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming on. Okay. Um, Katie, why don't you give us a little, I don't even know where to start this. Usually I say, tell us about yourself. <laughs> you know? <laughs> where would you like to start? Oh, well, um, I mean, I guess the most intriguing part of my story is when I was about two days before my 10th birthday, I was, as you said, abducted by a family friend. Um, somebody, he had built an underground dungeon specifically for kidnapping me and held me captive for 17 horrendous days. Prior to that, um, prior to the abduction, I, my life was horrible there also. I lived, um, in a neglectful home with, uh, my godmother and her husband physically and mentally abusing me daily and her husband, my godmother's husband, um, sexually abusing and raping me um, from the time that I was two until I was kidnapped. So anyway, you slice it. The first 10 years of my life were horrible. The um, past 22 years have been absolutely amazing. Yeah, I heard you on Nancy Grace recently. You know, she had John as a guest. And I yes. was re- I was really impressed because I remember the Katie Beer story, you know. I, I remember that story uh, vividly. I'm from New York. I'm from Staten Island. And you, this happened in Long Island, so this was all over the local news. And uh, that picture of you coming out of that uh, bunker in that little raincoat. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you remember that day when you, when you were walking out of there? I it I remember it, but it's all a blur. Right. Um, if that makes any sort of sense, there are times that I remember every single aspect of that day and of the 17 days, and then there are times that I'm like, uh, "That when did that happen?" So it's and it was all part of my recovery was, was being able to um, rest each memory away. Yeah, right. I, I can definitely. You seem like a really strong woman, you know. And I was very impressed with you uh, there when I heard you on thank Nancy you. Grace. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, now, so tell us what happened that day, the day that this guy – now, wait, even before that, because uh, did you know this guy before this? He was your neighbor, right? What kind of interaction did you have with him before? He was um, – John Esposito was a family friend. Um, somebody that I remember being in my life from almost day one – um, he, he, uh, he had lied to my biological mother and said that he was a part of the Big Brother Big Sister program. Right. And back, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, who the heck checks that? You take everybody out of face value. You say you're a good guy, you're a good guy. And um, my biological mother, not knowing any better, um, she accepted this word at face value. And at that point, since my biological half-brother had no real relationship with his biological dad, um, John Esposito was kind of the next best thing. He was this great guy in his 30s, um, spending his money and his time with my brother, um, buying him things, taking him places, and everything else. Um, So for me, growing up, um, my brother is six and a half years older than me. Okay. So, it, like I said, from the time, as early as I remember, I remember John Esposito being in my life. And there would be times as I got older, um, I'm pretty sure John Esposito bought me my first bike because nobody else in my life would. Um, and he would buy me little toys and trinkets and stuff like that. And that's as far as, um, anything went. There were a couple times that when he would take his biological brother to Six Flags in Jersey, um, he would let me tag along, and everything was fine. There were no red flags with John Esposito until the day that he kidnapped me. Wow. Okay. But do you think he was molesting your brother all this time? 
I found out after I was kidnapped and after, I'm going to say probably like my early 20s, okay. is when I finally found out that John Esposito had been molesting my brother. Gotcha. Okay. So now the day of the abduction, tell us what happened that day. Um, we have to step back two okay. days or maybe a day or so. Um, I was living in Mastic with my biological mother, grandmother, and brother. And my godmother's mother came to my house and said, and asked Marilyn, my biological mother, if I could come and visit for a couple of days because of the holiday and because of my birthday. And my biological mother was hesitant and said, all right, fine. And the reason why she was hesitant is because I had a uh, court order that I wasn't allowed to be near Linda's husband. Okay. So I have this court order that I can't be near Linda's husband, but Linda and her husband are apparently still living together. So against her best judgment, I would hope, um, she, Marilyn, let me go with my godmother's mother to visit my godmother for a couple days to celebrate Christmas and my birthday. And before I left, Marilyn explicitly told my godmother's mother that I was not allowed to be near Seth, and I also wasn't allowed to go near Donna Cezito. I knew why I could be near Sal. I did not know that I wasn't allowed to be with John, but those are the two things that I was told. I don't remember specifically if Stephen Larry was at Linda's house during those couple of days or not. But on December 28th, we were celebrating my birthday two days early. Or no, I'm sorry, on December 27th, we were celebrating my birthday a couple of days early. And Linda had invited John Esposito, even though I wasn't allowed to see him. And he didn't come. But the next day, on December 28th, he had come over to bring me my birthday present, which was a Barbie dream house. Oh, boy. And he brought the box and said, hey, I'm going to have to later to rebuild it. And I said, okay, and basically got away from him as possible because I'm not allowed to be around him. And um, so he, he then called Linda and asked Linda and Larry, my godmother, if he can take me to Spaceplex, which was an indoor arcade for kids. And... um. She says yes, and or no, she, I'm sorry. She asks me if I want to come, if I want to go. And I tell her no, I'm not allowed to see him. And she told John that I would go. So, lo and behold, I'm not allowed to see him, but I'm going to go with him. He comes by to the house later on in the afternoon, and I remember telling Linda that I didn't want to go. I didn't feel comfortable going. I wasn't allowed to go. And she reassured me, it will just be a You'll be home in a little while. It's okay. So she basically shoved me out the door with him. So it was just you and him? Just you and him? It was me and him, yep. Which, I will say, was not something that hadn't happened in the past. Um, There would be times that since John was older and hanging out with his friends a little bit more, John John Esposito would take me to um, Space Flex to um, a couple of places. It wasn't very often, a handful of times, if even that. Most of the time it was always with my brother. Um, So John gets me in his truck and I'm driving down the road and he asks me if I want to go to Toys R Us. And I said, no, I just want to go to Spaceplex. So he says, no, let's go to Toys R Us. Let's buy you another birthday present. So we end up going to, I forget the order, with with which has happened, but we ended up going with 7 and then we went to Toys R Us, and John bought me this um, Home Alone Nintendo game. <clears throat> and I didn't have a Nintendo. He knew that at my house, at Linda's house or at my biological mother's house, I did not have a Nintendo system. So he asked me if I wanted to go to his house and play the game. Oh, I and I explicitly told him no. And he, well, let's, let's go play it. Let's go to my house and we'll go play it. And I told him no, but there was nothing that I could do. I, 
there was literally nothing that I can do. There were no cell phones back then. I don't think I had a quarter to get to a pay phone to call anybody. So we went to John's house, which, again, not un- not unusual. We spent a lot of time at John's house, but always me and my <coughs> biological brother. Right. Um, so we go inside, and I'll paint a little bit of a picture here. The John Esposito's game room, where all the games, all the toys, anything that a child could ever imagine playing with in the early 90s, was in this man's bedroom. He had the toy closet in his bedroom, the game console in his bedroom, um, one of those basketball hoops in his bedroom, anything that you could possibly imagine, board games, everything. He even, if I remember correctly, had a mini fridge up there with snacks and sodas. There were only two places to sit in his bedroom, on the bed, and then there was a chair next to the TV. Right. Of course, you can't play the game sitting next to the TV, so I was sitting on his bed uh, playing the game. And, again, nine years old, there's nothing unusual about me sitting on some 40-year-old man's bed playing a game, because this is what I grew up with. It was what I was used to. The only thing that was different this time is my biological brother was not there. Um, I remember sitting on the bed, Indian style, playing this game, just feeling really uncomfortable, like something was off, and I was just very uneasy the entire time. And Esposito was in the game closet doing a couple things. I have no idea what he was doing. And then he went downstairs for a little bit and left me up in his bedroom. And then he came back upstairs, and it was almost like a um, switch flip. Okay. That he was this completely different person. He comes up and sits behind me on the bed, which, again, not unusual. There are so many unusual things about this story, but they weren't. It's sad that everything so far was normal. So he sits behind me, and then he puts his hand, his one hand, over my mouth and puts his other hand around my waist, and he pulls me up onto his lap. And he whispers in my ear, I'm not going to hurt you. And then he proceeds to sexually assault me while I was sitting on his bed. He then carries me downstairs into his office, which was a room in the house that was completely off limits to the kids because he worked for himself. So he carries me what did he do for a living? What down. Did he, do he was a, a contractor or something like that. Okay. Made a decent amount of money from what I remember. Um, and so he carries me downstairs. I'm kicking and screaming because he had just sexually assaulted me, even though the sexual assault wasn't something that was peculiar in the situation. But the fact that it was Esposito that had done it was not of the norm. And we go downstairs into his office, and I remember there being, like, couch pillows everywhere, like piles of them. And, again, it might have been, like, three of them that I remember, but 10 years old, taking this all in, I just remember couch pillows. And he then leaves me near his desk, and he's in the closet doing God knows what. So I, after a couple of seconds, I notice that the phone is sitting on his desk. So I grab it and try calling 911. I don't know if I actually dialed the numbers or if I hit the talk button because it was a cordless phone. I don't remember if anybody picked up. I didn't even know where I was. I knew I was in Bayshore, and that's about the extent of it. Right. So I don't know what I would have told the person that picked up anyway. But I remember then looking up and seeing John's legs there. He reaches down, grabs the phone from my hand, and throws it on his desk back in the cradle. And then he picks me up and tosses me into the closet. How and much did my you, back at, hit, at, at that age, how much do you weigh? Forty pounds, maybe. Really, that's tiny. Ten years I, old. From yeah. what I remember, like I was so malnourished. Really? Um, I really, I really don't think I weighed that much. Yeah. And how tall? I would were you? say fifty pounds would be stressing it. 
And, and, oh, wait, How tall was that? Yeah. I, maybe four foot. Okay. And what grade were you in? Uh, fourth. Fourth grade. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. Fourth, I can picture this. Fourth grade. Because my kid right now, she's in eighth grade, but I can remember third and fourth grade like it was yesterday. You know, time goes so fast. Yeah. But I could, I could just imagine a kid, like you said, 40, 50 pounds like that, you know, four foot tall. Okay. And were you yeah. involved in sports or anything like that or any kind of uh, activities or anything? No, I was involved in nothing. I hardly ever attended school growing up because if I was in school or doing anything else, I wouldn't be able to do Sal and Linda Ingolari's errands. Okay. So I basically, I didn't attend school. I was a truant child, nothing. What about friends? Did you have little friends, girlfriends? Um, I had, I remember I had like two or three, maybe four friends in the neighborhood. One of them was a next door neighbor. Um, the other one lived down the road from me, but Sal and Galeri, <clears throat> sorry, Sal, Sal and Galeri ruined that relationship for me and that friendship because he exposed himself to this little girl, so she was no longer allowed to play with me. Um, did, did, her parents, was did her parents call, other, call the cops about that? I honestly, I don't know. There were like two or three times growing up that I can explicitly remember children's services coming to the house to interview me. Yeah. And I can't remember if one of the times was after Sal had exposed himself to this little girl. But the cops never came. Not that I remember. This guy, Sal Inglisary, now that's your stepfather? Who was that? He, Sal Angolari was my, at that time, my godmother's husband. The godmother's so husband. So he was a caretaker of me. Now, how come you were so involved with your godmother and her husband? Uh, because at the age of either, like, three months old, um, this, there are two differing stories, and they differ so greatly. Okay. Um, when I was a couple months old, apparently my biological mother had gotten a migraine. And she asked my godmother, who was a close family friend, to babysit me for a couple hours. And the story that Marilyn tells is that when she tried to go pick me up a couple hours later, Linda wouldn't let her have me. Okay. So Marilyn just left. Um, the story that Linda told me growing up is that basically Marilyn abandoned me. And I didn't know what story to believe because the only caretaker that I really remember having, um, the only constant caretaker was Linda Inglary. And Linda Inglary was the, the, the godmother. Godmother, yep. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. And, and to this day, you never got a straight story on what really happened? Nope. Are any of these people still alive? Uh, Marilyn is, um, as John Esposito just died, um, right. a year and a couple months ago in prison and, um, Sal and Galeri died in, I believe 2009 because I was pregnant with my son and Linda, I have no idea what became of her and I really don't, that doesn't affect me. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but you gotta think, man, they, they might still be out there involved in this, the same kind of craziness, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I would hope Linda wouldn't have been, although, you know, in all the media that my story received, yeah, all of the media basically made Linda look like a saint for taking me in and everything else. The media um, never went over the abuse that I had sustained by Linda, and Linda was never prosecuted for um, the physical abuse or even the neglect from her. Uh, Lynn, Lynn is the one that let you go with the uh, Esposito? Yes. Okay. Wow. Okay. Now, let, let, <laughs> let, I know, man. It's just, but you're right. Back in those days, it was, it was a different world, you know? Yeah. Because I, I can't imagine my kid at 10 years old, I think she'd be fighting, you know, and, and fighting and, and uh I, it, like when she when she had that uneasy feeling, I think she would have ran out of there, you know, because uh, kids today yeah. is, they're just exposed to so much more. But I, I was I'm 52 years old, so I, I know what you're talking about. It was a different world back in those days. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay, now you're in this room. You're about 
50, 40, 50 pounds, four feet tall. This guy's picking you up and throwing you now. He throws you in the closet? Yep. Okay. He tossed me in the closet, and my back hit um, an exposed wall of nails. Oh, my God. And so I'm crying because of the pain of my back hitting these nails, and I'm crying because what the hell is going on? <laughs> like, yeah. just, what is going on? Um, and I just remember hiding my head in my hands and praying that this was all just a dream and that I'd wake up at any time. And the next thing that I remember is Esposito telling me to crawl down this downward shaft. And I told him no. And so he picked me up and just dropped me vertically down the shaft and then told me to crawl. And again, I said no. And he climbed down behind me. And then I basically, I had nowhere to go. Was, I, it, wait, was it dark I, down I there? Was there a light? I don't remember there being a light. Okay. Um, I don't, but <laughs> it had to have been whether a Zito had a flashlight or something. There had to have been something. Because he had to use a drill to open up the big door to go into the engine. Okay. Now, when he got this door open and he gets you down the shaft, was there a ladder, a staircase? What was there? Um, just a downward, maybe a foot or two drop into this dungeon, this six by six by seven foot dungeon, small room. Right, so but it wasn't that that deep underground. Then you're saying it was only a couple of feet under the ground. Yeah, it was. It wasn't that far. It was at least. I mean, it. I think the dungeon was maybe six or seven feet tall, and then above it was a concrete slab carport. So I don't think it really that far under. Like it wasn't buried under like a basement. It was kind of. Next to the house, but lower, if that makes any sort of sense. It, it does make sense. Now, um, was there a smell when you first went down there? What did it smell like? Was it damp? Was it cold? I don't remember. You don't remember? Okay. I honestly, right now, I don't remember. Okay. Well, that, that's just fascinating. Okay. Okay. We're getting close to the break. Okay, so why don't we uh, take the break now, guys? Okay, Patty and uh, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Patty and uh, and Scott. Uh, let, let's go into the break now. We'll take a nice little five-minute break. Uh, we're here with uh, Katie Beers. Okay, you guys might remember this story. It's the story in Long Island. She was kidnapped uh, by a family friend. They call him uh, this, this predator, Esposito. Uh, she's the author of the book. Um, uh, I gotta find it over here. Um, Buried Memories. My story by Katie Beers, and Beers is spelled uh, B-E-E-R-S, and you can find a link to that book on the uh, the Opperman Report blog. Okay, we're going to take a nice little five-minute break, everybody, and we'll be right back uh, after this. If you're looking for essential oils, stop by and check out Essentially Tammy on Facebook. Uh, she is Young Living Essential Oils Independent Distributor. These 100% therapeutic-grade oils help support the body's natural functions. You can click on her website posted on Essentially Tammy, that's T-A-M-I, uh, to see the current deals and check out the benefits of oils such as frankincense, joy, valor, lemon, thieves, panaway, and many more. Email Jocko Tammy, that's J O C A T A M I, at yahoo.com, or call 352 239 8546. That's 352 239 8546. West Bamboo, your number one source for timber, construction, and craft-grade bamboo poles, plants, products, and more. They specialize in eco-friendly reclaimed wood products uh, for the home and garden. They're located in Portland, Oregon, servicing the Northwest for over 10 years. They can be reached at 503-839-8126. That's 503-839-8126. Her Facebook page is Pacific West Bamboo. They can and do ship nationwide, and they're currently getting a new line of bamboo flooring, veneers, and laminates made from 
Guadawa bamboo, one of the world's strongest bamboos, grown and produced and manufactured in Central America using only economically and environmentally friendly practices. plans, 2D digital drawings, uh, 3D models, renderings, and more. That's infinityhomeplans.com. Get emailrevealer.com. That's my website, emailrevealer.com. And we offer all different kinds of services. Uh, current place of employment locate. Let's say you're trying to locate where your ex-husband or your ex-wife is, uh, is working so you can collect on child support. You contact us. We can locate their place of employment for you and help you collect on that child support. Uh, let's say you think that your husband or your wife is cheating on you. Give us their email address and we can trace it back to online dating uh, websites and uh, dating services. Uh, so we have a multitude of services on emailrevealer.com. They want their men to come back, so they've written these beautiful love letters, and they've put them all in this beautiful coffee table book. Uh, first, the letters are written in Spanish, handwritten. You can see pictures of the people writing the books. And then it comes on after that, and it's typewritten in English. Uh, and then also, too, uh, the, the second half of the book is teaching you how to make authentic... Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I am your host, private investigator at Opperman. Uh, the show is brought to you by uh, Audible.com. Go to audibletrial.com front slash Opperman Report, and you sign up and get a free audio book. We are here tonight with Katie Beers. Uh, just an incredible story. It's kind of a draining story, even listening to it, even though the, Katie is such a pleasant woman, you know, in so many ways. Uh, but it, it's such a draining story to hear this. My God, you, you've been to hell and back. Yeah. And, and, oh my God, okay. <laughs> okay. So let's, um, now, where you left us off, you were just being abducted by this guy, and he's throwing you down into this, uh, prison chamber that he had constructed. Now, it's my understanding that he constructed this with you in mind. Yeah. How yes, do we, as how, far as I know. Yeah, now, how do we know that, though? Um, he had told, I guess, his lawyer that he had built it specifically for me at one point, and then at another point, he told people that he built it as a bomb shelter. So there, there's really no true, this is why it was built, but right. I was told that it was specifically for me. Now, I had also heard, too, that while he was constructing this, that you would be out there playing in the dirt? Yes. Um, I had a memory probably when I was like 12 or 13 years old. 
that my brother and one of his friends were jumping from the top of the dirt mound into this dungeon and climbing back out. Okay, so oh, now that's interesting. So you could see the construction of this dungeon from outside the house. Yes. And don't none of their neighbors like you know strolled by and said, "Hey, what are you doing?" Um, there were privacy fences that were probably okay. how tall the privacy fence, eight feet. Plus, it was the where it was being constructed was in the backyard of this house, and I really don't think there were any structures on either side that you'd really be able to distinctively say, "Hey, there's a big hole in this guy's yard." Okay. Now, do you suspect, or do you have any kind of information that he could have? Uh, had any other prisoners down there before you? There was speculation, but none was ever found. Well, who did they speculate that he had down there? Um, I don't know if they speculated that it was somebody specific or just that there was maybe another person. But Esposito had tried in the 70s to kidnap a little boy. And... Um, I, obviously didn't go as planned for him. And was he arrested for that? I don't think he was arrested. He was questioned, and he talked his way out of it, saying that he thought the little boy needed a ride home. Okay. So now you left this off where he was uh, shoving you down to this chamber. Now, you had to be uh, beyond terrified at that point. Oh, gosh, yes. I... Like I said, I had no idea what was going on. This was all just completely frightening. Um, Esposito was a family friend. He's somebody that I'd known all my life that wouldn't hurt a fly, yet now he's doing this to me. Um, he didn't tell me why he was putting me down there. He didn't tell me how long he was keeping me down there for. He really didn't say a whole heck of a lot about me being down in this dungeon. Um, but he then within the dungeon, there was this like, three foot wide by um, two foot high or two foot wide by three foot high by like six foot long um, coffin sized box okay. in there. So, and there was a bunch of other stuff in this room too. So I just remember trying to look around and really just get my bearings, like what is going on, what is this room, is there a way for me to do this? can I do? And um, I remember shortly after being in there, he had actually assaulted me and he had raped me. Um, and then he made me record this tape saying there's a man with a knife, oh my God, here he comes, or something along those lines. Okay, well, wait a minute, but, but first he locks you down there. Yeah. Then, then shortly after he comes down there to visit you, and, and what does he say? Um. Well, he was, until he left, he was down there with me the whole time, so maybe still like a half hour, um, except for he went upstairs to go get me a couple of blankets. And when he had left the first time is when he asked me to make this recording that he was going to play for my godmother on her answering machine. And there's a man with a knife. He kidnapped me. Oh, my God, here he comes. Right. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I remember that. Re reading about that as well. Okay. And, and uh, okay, then what, what were you about to say after that? Um, well, he made, he made this recording, and then he left then for okay. a while. And he told me, that all he told me was that he was going to go ahead and go play this recording for my godmother. Um, he was going to either play it on for her if she picked up or play it on her answering machine. And she hadn't picked up, so it was on her answering machine, which was almost a godsend um, because then the FBI and police were able to listen to it and decipher it. Um, Oh, I remember now what I was going to say. Since he left to while I was doing the recording, he told me specifically what to say. There's a man with a knife, and oh, my God, here he comes. And then I waited a couple seconds, 
And then I said, I'm at on that Big John's house, because that's what we called him, Big John. Okay. And um, so I'm at Big John's house, and I he comes downstairs then with the blankets, and he looks at me, and he's like, all right, I'm going to listen to the recording now. And so I, like, died inside. I was like, oh, my gosh, he's now listening to this. And then he hears me say, and I'm at Big John's house. Right. So he got angry, and he hit me. Oh. And then he made me record it again. And, of course, now since he had just hit me, I was now crying and recording this. Um, so in his mind, it sounded really genuine. I was really scared. And um, he left then for... God, what seemed like hours, and he went and played this tape for from the Spaceplex parking lot um, or somewhere close to the Spaceplex, because at that time was when he, he told um, the Spaceplex security, the Spaceplex manager, that he couldn't find me because so, we were there the whole time. Right, so he goes back to Spaceplex and he says, "Oh my God, this kid I was with is lost." I guess first he played it over a payphone or something like that, right? Yeah. And then he says, oh, no, this kid is lost. I, I bet he still had the tape recorder in his car. He must have, you know? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> this whole thing is crazy. Okay, so now then what happened? The police responds to the, the Spaceplex there? Um, as far, yeah, the police respond to Spaceplex, and, of course, they question John, who said that he turned around to go get change, and then I was gone. Um and they did, gosh, they did roadblocks that night, stopping cars, looking in cars and trying to find me. And they had um, volunteers out very quickly looking for me all around Spaceplex. It was, it was definitely quite an ordeal for a couple of days afterwards with everybody trying to find me. Um, and then shortly after... Esposito had spoken with the police. They had a strong suspicion, and A, since he was the last person that had left seen me, yeah. um, and B, just because of the type of person that he portrays himself, they kind of knew that he was the last person to see me and that it wasn't some random person that had kidnapped me, that he had me. They just didn't know where or how. So, but... They were just, like, questioning him, like, or they didn't pull him in and really sit, sit him down and grill him, like, hold him. I don't I don't think they grilled him right away, but it was more or less just, like, the normal run-of-the-mill type of questions, like, where did he see me, what was I wearing, right. things like that. And then um, it was, I believe, the next day or the day after that the police set up shop in um, the front house because John had an apartment building behind that he was living in. So they set up shop in the front house and were constantly monitoring his movements and when he came and left and when he put garbage out, they were examining everything. Yeah, I bet they were, yeah. Okay, and then there was a reward. They come, came. Who came up with the money for the reward? Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know if it was the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I know that they had um, a little bit of a part in my um, in the early stages. I don't know if it was them or who came up with the reward because it definitely was not my family. They did right. not have a cent to their name. Now, and you know, maybe it was John. John had money. Maybe he put up the reward money. <laughs> I, did, I don't I, know. I, I said, well, I can't believe you didn't find these things out. I, I, would, have, <laughs> I would have to know every single detail. I, it's just because I don't know. This, this, it would just drive me crazy. Now, um, oh. there was a TV set down there. Yeah. Okay. Now, now you were watching the, the hunt for you. You're watching the news. Yes. There was a TV in the small coffin size box. And with that, it had, I, I'm pretty sure it had cable. Um, so I was able to watch, like, News 12 Long Island, which, of course, as you remember, I'm sure had the 24-hour news. Um, and then I was also able to watch, like, ABC News and um, 
whatever the W used to be, used to be WPIX. Um, I was able to watch all those news programs, and it was almost, I don't want to say comforting because that just sounds morbid, but it was comforting to see myself on these programs because I knew people were still looking for me. I knew that they weren't giving up hope. Oh, yeah, that had to be a huge yeah. relief. Yeah, oh, my God, because you're, you're in the now, – now, was it dark down there, or did you have a light, or just the light from the TV? Just the light from the TV and the smaller um, coffin-sized box. Okay, then did you have a bed at all? Did I have a bed? Yeah. There was, like, a blue camping mat type of thing, maybe an inch thick foam okay. material. Okay. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. And then uh, the, the, he had constructed a bathroom down there to a toilet? Um, No, there was literally just a toilet that had a plastic bag in it. Oh. So now, did he? Did you use it? Um, I tried not to as much as I could because I didn't want to have myself exposed in front of him. Sure. Because that would maybe... He, um, tweak his urges and he'd want to assault me again. Um, so I actually would go to the bathroom in the smaller size coffin box down at the bottom where I wasn't lying. Oh my God. So you were using the bathroom in, in the, in the coffin box. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, now, now it, the, the smell must have started right away. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I think I blocked from my memory. Yeah. So I really, I would imagine, but I can't remember specifically. Yeah, I could imagine that. But not only, now thinking about that, now like the stench of it and just like the health implications of it. Yeah. It's very, yeah. Yeah, because now you have kids, you change diapers, you know, you got you to gotta wash your hands. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's a whole other world. And you'd think like nowadays, oh, yeah. if someone did this, they'd give you baby wipes, you know, but back then it was just a whole different world. Yeah. Okay, but now uh, now during these 17 days, though, he was coming, he had to come down and feed you every single day, right? He would come down, yes, every 24 hours, um, basically right after, like, what would be dinner time, like right after the evening news or right around that time. Right. And um, it started off that he would be able to come down for longer periods of time at first. And then um, the longer I was missing, the um, more often the police were doing like spot checks on him. Okay. So the less time he was able to spend down in the dungeon with me, which was good because then he couldn't, he didn't have the time or the opportunity Toward the end to sexually assault me. Well, thank God for that. Okay, but now, yeah. but he was, he was only feeding you one meal a day. Um, yeah, and he would bring down like junk food, um, pudding, candy, soda, anything that you can imagine that would be bad for a ten-year-old girl is what I was eating on a daily basis. Um, there were times that he would bring me like a Wendy's cheeseburger or something like that, or he would make me a sandwich. And anything that was not prepackaged, I would not eat because I was afraid he would put something into the food. So anything that he made himself or that he could easily open and repackage, I didn't touch. Really? Even though you must have been starving? Yeah, I know. Not a chance. (laughs) Now, what about water? Did you have water? Um, the only thing I remember him bringing down were cans of soda. Oh, my God. What was this guy thinking? He had a job and stuff like that, but he was completely insane? Yeah, there, he, I mean, pedophile. He was a straight-up pedophile that only had one thing on his mind. But for the 17 days that he had me abducted, he was still, during the day, living his normal life, going to work and doing whatever he would do on a, on a normal day. And, and for those whole 17 days, was he abusing you every single day? I would say a good portion. Really? More, more often than not, yeah. Really? Because you would think with all the pressure of the cops being outside and all the – did he seem nervous when he came down to see you? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. He was – he had to have been um, suffering from bipolar, schizophrenia, or there was something 
just not right because one time he would come down and he would be happy-go-lucky, how are you, we're going to get you out of here soon, and then the next day he would be like a savage rapist. Um, it was just, I know, from day to day, I had no idea which John personality I was going to get. Every day was completely different. But you could watch it. Did you talk to him about what you were singing on the news? Um, I would talk to him. I would tell him that my mom missed me. I would tell him that my brother and grandmother missed me. Um, I would tell him that I wanted to go home. I would ask him how long he would keep, he was keeping me for. I would ask him, um, I would try to, um, sympathize with him. I would try to make him angry. I would try to be really, really nice. I would try to get him to think about my future. Anything to just, get some sort of reaction out of him. And, of course, it was never the reaction that I wanted. He always had an answer for everything. Um, like when I would say my biological mom missed me, he would say, well, she hasn't been around for the past 10 years, so why does she miss you now? Why didn't she miss you before? Um, or I would ask him, I would say, I want to go to school. I really want to go to school. How am I going to learn? And his response would be, well, I'll teach you what you need to know. So then I'd tell him, that I want to learn how to drive a car and I want to work. And he would tell me that he would teach me to drive and that he had enough money for both of us so I would never have to work. And then I told him, okay, well, I want to get married and have kids. And mind you, I'm 10. He yeah. was like 40, 43. And he told me that when it was time and I was ready, that he would marry me and he would have children with me. And now, when he would say something like the, that to you, like, what did you say? And, and what? And the kids will live down here in, the, in the, this dungeon with me? Yeah, I, um... Like, you must have been honestly, confused. Honestly, I that, just yeah. got turned off and shut up. <laughs> yeah, oh, I could <laughs> imagine. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could imagine. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Yeah, I remember one time I told him that I didn't want that, and that upset him. So, he... <laughs> He had to have realized shortly after he started this plan that it wasn't going as planned because the cops were right at his front door. Yeah. But he still had this fantasy that somehow he was going to keep you as his slave down there uh, mm -hmm. for years to come. Well, his fantasy was that the police would stop looking for me. Marilyn would stop looking for me. Everybody would stop looking for me. And I'd go back up to the surface and live as his wife or something along those lines. Like, he just had this fantasy worked up that we were going to live happily ever after. Really? Because now, but it seems like his previous interest was in boys, though. What? But was he ever married or had a girlfriend before this craziness? As far as I know, no. Um and, yeah, I mean, the kid that he tried kidnapping in the 70s was a little boy. Um, and then I know for a fact that he had molested my biological brother. I don't know if he um, sexually assaulted any of my brother's friends or anything like that or anybody else. Um, but, yeah, he had an interest in the little boys. And then when John got too old, his interest turned to me. When my brother John got too old, um, Esposito's interest turned toward me. So I don't know if it was just straight up pedophilia, young child, because it seemed indiscriminate. Yeah, and I okay, because yeah, it just can't seem like I don't want to get too far ahead of, of the story. Okay, yeah. is there anything you want to tell us about while you were still down there before you got out? Um, John offered to pay me for the time that I was down there. <laughs> Um, I forget how much it was, but at some point he came up with a pay scale. Um, every day that I was down there, from X day on, he was going to give me either $100 or $50 or something. But I remember when I came out of the dungeon, I think I had $100. Okay, That's wait a second. Up. So he was actually paying oh, wait. He was actually, he was actually giving paying me. Money. Yeah. Wait a second. Now, whose idea was that? <laughs> <laughs> it definitely is, yeah. 
Yeah, I think he was trying to make me feel better about myself, I think. I don't know. Like, was I supposed to feel like performing or was it me earning my keep? I, I don't know. But, yeah, I came out with $500. Okay, but the thing is, now you're a 10-year-old kid. <laughs> 10-year-old kid. And I know you're a 10-year-old kid, and he is giving you money. And, you know, because you do adapt to any situation you're in, especially when you're young. Yeah. But in life, you know, you get thrown in a maximum security prison. You're, you're adapting in a couple of weeks later, you know. So you're down in this dungeon, which is just surreal to begin with. But now he, he comes up with this plan. Listen, I want to start to pay. I want to put you on a payroll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It would be it would be really bad if he paid you by a check and said, Don't worry, I'll cash your checks for you in the future. Hang <laughs> on to these checks. I'll cash them for you. But he's actually giving it's this is I can't believe we're laughing about this, but he gives you cash. Now as this ten year old little yeah. girl, are you kinda of getting the cash and saying, Well, he's like you're know, counting it, you know, and and checking it out? You must have been. I remember it was under my pillow. I had a pillow in oh, there and I God. put it under my pillow because Really, where else? Where else am I gonna put it? Um, I didn't even have a sock to put it in, um, but I'm like stashing it under my pillow. And so again, like I said, it, he must have started this on like day 12 because he had me down there for 17 days. He must have started it on maybe day 11 because day 17 wasn't a full day. Um, but yeah, he was giving me a hundred dollars. I mean, I came when I was about. I think I finally got the money when I was about 16. 15 or 16. So, you know what? I went out and that closed with it. It's confiscated. Oh, my. This is just odd. You can't make this kind of stuff up. Hey, by the way, now, there was a movie. They made a movie, right? It was a very bizarre movie uh, where this girl, she didn't pick up her kid after dance. She didn't pick up her little sister after dance practice because she was jealous of her. And the neighbor kidnapped her and put her in a dungeon. Did you ever see that movie? No, I don't think so. I was trying to think of the name of it. I'll find it. I'll send you the link if I come up with it. It was sort of like a weird, uh, dark comedy type of movie. And uh, the neighbor fell in love with this little girl next door, and he, he kidnapped her and, and put her in this dungeon. They didn't show her in the dungeon or anything like that, uh, but uh, it had a base sort of on this, because I don't think there's any other stories of little 10-year-old girls. Uh, yeah. No. I thought I, I would hope not. I would hope not, too. Okay. Yeah. My God. But the thing about the money yeah. it is just so bizarre, this man's thinking. And then you don't get the money till yeah. you're 16. Yeah. And what was that day like? How'd you get it in the mail? Um, no, I think somebody brought it to my house, I think, because it was still, if I remember correctly, it was still an evidence staff that my brother <laughs> cut open. <laughs> okay, um, people in the chat room are saying about what an inspiration you are because you're so positive <laughs> and you seem to have amazingly healed. And I, I totally have to agree with that. This is just unbelievable. Because, you know, I like to make jokes during my interviews. And I was and, and I was saying, hey, I dug up this guest this week, you know, Katie Pierce. <laughs> I was it's going to be the straight-laced interview you've ever had. <laughs> yeah, I was... But, no, I, you know, I can't help. But not joke around about it, but I can't help but to have um, an upbeat perspective on it because I'm not letting the jerks in my childhood, I'm not letting them define who I am. I'm not letting them control my life. Right. And to me, that's the, that's the biggest win for me is that I was able to overcome everything and I was able to heal. I was able to trust men. I was able to have children, get married, have a job. Um, so I'm not letting them win. Right. And I noticed from, from your interviews and a little the stuff I watched and online and stuff like that, you really are one of those dedicated mothers, you know, that really, really throws their whole heart into it. And I, and I, I respect that so much. That That's such a uh, an admirable quality uh, that I see as a, a, a mother that really enjoys being a mom, you know. Uh, how old are your kids so. now? Um, Logan is five and a half, and Haley is three and a half. Five and a half and three and a half. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> now, we're getting close. You know, yeah, we're getting really close to the break. Let's take the break. We're here with Katie Beers, uh, one uh, 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 an inspiration, and even one of the chatters is saying Katie is a hero, and you're, you really are. Uh, I can only Thank imagine that the strength is, you know, like, it's such a tender age, 10 years old, you know, to be going through all of this. Uh, but uh, where Katie Beers, her book is... Uh, 
Buried Memories, My Story, and then it's updated edition. And it's, it's the, the black covered book. And, uh, oh my God, it has this little, uh, uh, tragic picture of this little girl in this little white, uh, nightgown lying on the floor in the dark there. But you weren't wearing that. You had clothes, right? You wore the clothes you were wearing that day. You didn't get to change your clothes at all, did you? Um, I bo Esposito brought me down like boys sweatpants and underwear and t-shirt after a couple days. I think actually he had a nightgown down there for me. Um, and after that got too gross for me to wear for too long, he Ugh. brought me down, I guess, a spare set of clothes that he had for one of the little boys that used to stay at his house. I don't know where they came from. But that's what I ended up being rescued in. Okay, yeah, interesting that he had little boys' clothes and lying around his house. Okay, so we're here with Katie Beers, the author of Buried Memories, My Story, updated uh, edition. That's the newest one. It's coming out uh, in April 2015. Um, and you can get the link is on my uh, uh, blog, The Opperman Report. Um, and we'll be right back after this uh, these uh, commercial break here, uh, back with more of Katie Beers. Are you awake and aware? 
Start by asking yourself some questions. Do you question any and all authority? This is not necessarily a bad thing. Do you question laws being put into place each and every day? And who really believes that any one man or woman should have the supposed power to do so? Do you question that your vote actually counts on election day? Because really, most all of those running are related by bloodline, just as British rule. Do you question the idea why one must work so hard to make a living? After all, this is the only planet in the galaxy you have to pay to live on. If you have answered yes to any or all of these questions, you are awake and aware, or at least well on your way to becoming so. Welcome to Awake Radio. AwakeRadio.us AwakeRadio.co.uk Okay, welcome back to the Opera Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. This show is brought to you by Audible.com. Go to audibletrial.com uh, front slash Opperman Report, and you get a free audio book. Okay? And, and don't forget, guys, we really do need your, do- your donations. I was really hoping to see some money come in tonight uh, through the PayPal donations, uh, OppermanReport at gmail.com, because uh, that's how we survive here. And, and, and the reason why we don't have the, uh, uh, the um, uh, last week's show up on YouTube yet or up on Spreaker yet is because, you know, we have – very minor technical uh, repairs we need to do, and, and we don't even have the money to do that. So we really, really, really uh, need your donations. It would really be encouraging to see something come through tonight uh, so we don't feel like we're doing this for nothing, <laughs> okay? So good old PayPal donation, okay, to your, your good friend here uh, at Opperman trying to help you out every, every Friday night. Uh, we are on here tonight with Katie Beers. Okay, it was just uh, everyone's loving you in the chat room, uh, calling you here and stuff like this. Uh, she's author of the book uh, Buried Memories. Uh, my story, uh, updated edition. Okay, and then you can get a link to that on the Opperman Report blog. Do you remember where we left off, uh, Katie? Oh, we were talking about my the money that Mr. Yeah. had paid me. <laughs> I know, yeah. But now, so we're getting to the point, though. Uh, you know, and it must have felt like a months. You know, now did you have yeah. any inkling that you were about to get freed? I had no clue. Um, John had, Esposito had started talking about um, killing himself. He talked about turning himself in, but mostly it was about killing himself, which, as I'm sure everybody can understand, this scared me to no end because if he killed himself, nobody's ever going to find me in this underground dungeon that is hidden Oh, well, and nobody would ever find me. So, yeah. Well, let me ask you this. When when you were down there, could you hear anybody walking around upstairs or or voices or anything? There was one time where I thought that I heard people upstairs. And um, so I screamed and yelled and was banging on the ceiling. And that was very, very early on in my abduction, maybe a couple days couple days in, and um, after that, Esposito had actually, he, I guess, had heard me. Right. Um, And at that time, he decided, yeah, he can't have this. So there was a chain in the dungeon, in the coffin-sized box, that was right about where my head would have been. So he put the chain around my neck and padlocked it. So that if a situation like that ever happened again, that I wouldn't be able to bang on the ceiling of this dungeon. But now before everybody freaks out that I'm chained by my neck. Right. Um, I actually, a day or so prior to this even happening, Esposito had left me alone to walk around in the dungeon for a couple of minutes. I had convinced him to. Yeah. Um, because I had spilled a soda or something on my blanket. So the blanket was wet and I needed a new one. Um, so he was going to lock me back in the coffin side box. And I was like, no, just let me walk around for a couple minutes. You're going to be back down. So he walked around this coffin size box. So as soon as I knew he was out of there, I started down for anything that I could find that would help me get the heck out of this box. 
And one of the things that I found was on one of the shelves were a bunch of keys, loose keys. So I grabbed one or two of them and put them under my pillow. I had no clue what they were for because the padlock wasn't on the chain at that point, just the chain was there. Yeah. So I had no clue what these keys were for, but I knew somehow they were going to help me at some point. So after he chained my neck, I um, remembered that I had had those keys under there. So I grabbed one of them, and um, it worked. It unlocked the padlock. So I was able to unlock myself, so I was still able to move around. Otherwise, I would have not been able to move. I would have had to um, relieve myself right where I was lying instead of at least at the bottom of this coffin-sized box. Um, And then I would hear, luckily, I would hear the drill when he would come back down. So I had a couple of seconds before um, I knew he would be in there, so I was able to get myself locked back up. So wait a second. Now, this happened. He, he started putting the chain around your neck how early on and how many days in? Only a couple of days because I remember it was so early on because I heard the police upstairs. Right. So I'm going to say maybe less than five days in, if even that generous. It was but, a couple of days in. But he thought the whole 17 days that he had you down there chained by your neck. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Anything else you want to tell us about while you were down there? Um, goodness gracious, I don't, I don't think so. Okay, so then you get out. What? How that? What happened now? Why did? Why did you get out? How did he? He led them to this chamber. Um, I think Esposito had finally kind of had enough. Um. Uh, the torture and the torment of the police constantly at his house and surveillancing him and me asking him questions. I think it was just finally his breaking point. And you know what? Thank God that was his breaking point and not him committing suicide. Yeah, thank God Um, for that. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. Although he assured me that in his safe that he had directions as to how to find me, which my question is, is if the directions truly existed, why were they not found during one of the two or three times that the police searched his home? That's always been my question, just throwing that out there. Right, but, um, but, the only, but the only one who told you that he had these directions was, was him. He was probably lying to was you. him, yeah. 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 Um, so finally he decided to tell his lawyer Not even the police. He went to his lawyer and told his lawyer that he had had me. And before his lawyer even called the police, at least from my understanding of the whole situation, before his lawyer called the police to alert them that they knew where I was and who had me, they called the DA and struck a plea deal while I was still being held captive, chained by my neck. They were striking a plea deal. Otherwise, Esposito wouldn't ever tell where I was. Well, yeah, listen, when you're out now, okay, I'd be complaining <laughs> too, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the thing is, you know, like, thank God, you know, that he made the deal and got you out, you know. He told me you yeah. were. Exactly. So he comes down into his dungeon in the middle of the day. Right. He never would come down in the middle of the day. I though I don't remember him ever coming down in the middle of the day. So he comes down and I'm freaking out, like, what the heck's going on? Why is he down here in the middle of the day? And then I hear him talking to somebody. Right. And I I have no idea who he's talking to, what he's talking about, but I know that there's somebody else down there. So I was like, Oh my god, he brought somebody down here to molest me or something. Like right. just all these thoughts running through my head. And he opens up the door, and there are these two men down there. I believe that they were in suits. And um, they tell me that I'm safe now, and I could go with them. And I didn't didn't move, because after all of the questions that I had asked John for the past 17 days, 
I was like, you know, what if she's playing this little twisted game with me? Like, oh, what? how is she going to react if she thinks she's free? Right. So I just stayed there. I didn't move. And then they told, they again told me that I was free and I was going to, I was out and I could go upstairs. So I grabbed all my worldly possessions from this dungeon, which mm-hmm. were my clothes that I had worn down there and my $500. And I ran upstairs as quickly as I could, as quickly as I could crawl through the tunnel and climb up there. And they, they, there was one or two people up there that were helping me out. And if I remember correctly, it was all men. Right. Oh, all men. I don't think there was another scene. There might have been, but I don't remember. Um, so we go and we sit in the living room. And I'm sitting either next to a caddy corner or across from John Esposito, the man that had just held me captive for 17 days. I'm in the same room with him. So still, I, I wasn't at ease. I, I was still in the back of my head. What is the police up looking for me? And these are John's friends. Right. That have me now. Um, so just nothing really started, even though they were telling me where the police, you're safe, blah, blah, what blah, What about blah, your blah. mother, your mother or your godmother? And no friendly face that you knew was there? No, no friendly face that I knew of that was there. Um, so then apparently, I don't remember this, um, but apparently I either told Esposito that everything was going to be okay or that I loved him or something like that, um, and I gave him a hug. I don't remember any of this, but I was told by several people that were there that that did happen. And I'm like, A, why the heck did these people let that happen? Yeah, right. And B, B, was I still trying to protect myself as if these people weren't the police? Like, I I don't know. Um, I don't really, I blocked that portion of my um, recovery off of my um, release out of my head because it's just unfathomable to me that I sat in the same room with this man, even if it was for three seconds. Yeah, right, without screaming and stuff. They should have had him or me out first. Um, But so then they brought me to an unmarked police car, and so I'm sitting in the back seat in that infamous blue jacket. Yeah. Where'd you get that from? Uh, One of the police officers, one of the detectives. And I remember whoever was sitting in the back seat with me told me to get ready, brace myself, and smile. Get out of here. And, yeah, and so I'm sitting in the back seat. I'm like, what the hell is going on? What uh, What's happening? And then they open up. Esposito had these really tall gates to his driveway, yeah. just like privacy gates. And they open up, and there is just a sea of reporters. Now, who I don't know who tipped off the reporters, if the reporters were tipped off, or if that was the normal, that's how many people were always in front of Esposito's house during this time. Um, but there is this sea of reporters. The police couldn't, I don't know if they couldn't go fast or they didn't want to go fast, but they were going like literally 20 miles or two miles per hour. And I remember just somebody running alongside of the car, snapping pictures of me. And were, were you a, a, um, embar- you must have been embarrassed, right? Um, I don't really know. Like I was, I I felt dirty because I hadn't showered in 17 days. I was literally sitting in my own filth for 17 long days. Um, and I had no idea what was happening. I didn't know where I was going. Nobody was telling me anything just to sit there and look pretty and smile basically. I don't think anybody said look pretty, but they told me to smile and wave. Um, so then it was in the police car that I um, that somebody asked me if I was okay, and I looked at them, and I showed them the $500, yeah. and I was like, can you tell me if this is real? And they looked at me, and they were like, where did you get this from? And I was like, oh, um, John gave it to me, <laughs> and then they took it. Oh. They confiscated it. <laughs> I bet it was more than but, 500. You only got yeah. back 500. It's probably 5,000. It's like, <laughs> like, that was my money. Um, but, yeah, so then they, the police bring me to one of the police um, precincts on Long Island. I'm not quite sure which one it was. And um, they bring me in the back way. 
and they bring me into a basement room, a concrete center wall room, oh is where they have to bring me to ask me questions or interrogate me because that is what it felt like. Um, I was still sitting, I believe, in the same clothes. Maybe they brought me new clothes. I don't remember that. But um, I had not eaten in 17 days, and they brought me something from a vending machine. Oh, my which God. Which is basically what I had been eating for the past 17 days. Okay, and what year was um, this? What year was this? 93. 1993. Okay, it wasn't the Stone Ages, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, they couldn't yeah. bring you to a hospital? They didn't bring you to a hospital first. Not yet. No, nope. didn't bring me to the hospital yet. They had they had to debrief me, I guess. Yeah. Um, make sure I was okay, which okay. But in the grand in the grand scheme of things, seriously, let me have a hot meal. Let me get in bed. Let me get examined. Let me shower. Let me, I don't know, see my parent, see my biological mom, pet my dog. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but no, inside it felt like an interrogation, um, and I jokingly say that because obviously I know that it wasn't, but at 10 years old, that's what it felt like. Sure. So they're asking me all these questions, not only about the abduction, but also since John Esposito had brought to the media attention the fact that I was sexually abused by um, Sal and Galeri, they were asking me about that too. So they're compounding all of my trauma into – an hour or four-hour interrogation. Then it's later in the evening, and they bring me out the back entrance, and I go to, um, gosh, what was it called? Schneider's Children's Hospital, I believe it was, in New Hyde Park. Okay. And they bring me they bring me in this back entrance, if I remember correctly. And they bring me to a room, and I basically I lay down in the room for about 30 seconds. And then they bring me into an examination room. And I swear the examination room, if you've ever watched, like, any of, like, the hospital TV shows, that, like, those sterile rooms that are just all chrome metal and bright, shining light. Yeah. That's, that's what it felt like. And I had not been in sunlight or direct light of any sort in 17 days. So this is I'm laying on this table, being examined, being rape kit, um, blood tests for AIDS, um, STD tests, anything that you can imagine. I'm sure they probably ran a pregnancy test, even though I was only 10 years old. Right. Um, but there's this nurse sitting at my head, and she's trying to comfort me and ask me if there's anything that she can get me. And I looked at her, and I said, I I'd like something to drink. And I remember somebody saying, oh, you can't have anything to drink yet. And then a little sip, like literally a sip of orange juice appeared. And so I'm still laying on the table being examined, and they're giving me this little sip of orange juice through a straw. I don't know how long the examination lasted. It seemed like forever because I was being poked and, poked and prodded and re-violated and everything else. Um, and still haven't seen so your then, parents? You haven't seen a friendly face yet still? Nope, not yet. Amazing. So then, then they bring me to the um, the hospital room where I had started off, and they assured me that there was going to be a cop outside, nobody was going to get in, and that shouldn't be in, and everything else. So I felt a little bit at ease, and they asked me again if there was anything that they could do. And it's nighttime now. It's like late, late, late at night. And I was like, well, I, you know, I'd really like to shower, um, take a bath, do something, and I'm really hungry. And they said to me, they're like, oh, well, well, the kitchen's closed. We'll see if we can't get to something. And my jaw at that point almost dropped. I was like, really? Okay. That just happened. So I think it was, if I remember correctly, I want to say it was the ADA. Um, or it was, it was somebody. And like, we'll get you something. What do you want? And all I wanted was Chinese food. Aww. That is all that I wanted. And thank God I'm on an island in the early 90s at 10, 11, 12, 3 o'clock in the morning. You could get Chinese food. That's right. It's Long Island. So, yeah. <laughs> somebody somewhere got me pork fried rice and wonton soup, which is the only Chinese food that I ate and still eat. Oh. Um, so, yeah, it's like midnight now, and I'm finally eating. After being rescued, we'll say around, like, noon or 1. 
Um, so yeah, just the whole, I don't know, the whole situation was impressive. Um, or lack of situation was impressive. And now I'm, I'm a really big advocate of child advocacy centers. Um, they hold, there's one on Long Island now because of my case. Um, and child advocacy centers just hold a really special and close place to my heart because there are these places that kids can go to not only report abuse, but it's all, it's a kid friendly environment. You go, you tell one person your story. There's a, um, usually a detective and a therapist there. And then there's a kid friendly examination room. Right. Which is sad that they have to exist. But going from the experience that I had from, like, a sterile, chromed-out, bright room to at least a room that has Disney characters on it. Um, but, yeah, it's just like that. A whole – the whole hospital and the whole um, debriefing is what sticks in my head the most because I was like, these people, whoever was in charge of everything, didn't have the common sense to say – okay, we understand we have to do all these tests on Katie. We have to make sure she's okay. But is it going to hurt anybody to get me a sub or yeah, something, right. something to eat? I wasn't very big. I didn't eat a lot. It wasn't going to harm anything. Um, so get, me, get me a bag of potato chips. Why not? Yeah, it, these, they couldn't have been parents, the, these guys, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it just, it's really dumbfounded. Dude, dude. This whole story is just unbelievable. Now, from there, they took you where? To to your mother's house, the godmother's house? What happened? Where'd you go from there? No, no, from the hospital. Um, they, um, they didn't release me from the front room or from the main entrance of the hospital, and they didn't release me from the back entrance of the hospital because there was media everywhere. They brought me down the elevator on a gurney with a um, sheet over my head <laughs> okay. and wheeled me and wheeled me outside because there was just so much media out there that this was really the only like safe way to get me out of the hospital. But by, by then you had so a change, then, you had a change of clothes though by then, right? Oh God, I hope so. I really hope so. I don't remember, but I'm going to go out on, on a limb and say, yes, I okay. did. It. <laughs> um, so then it's um, January 14th. I was rescued on January 13th, and it's January 14th, and I get in this car in New Hyde Park, Long Island, and I drive out to East Hampton. And anybody that has ever driven on Long Island knows that going from New York City to East Hampton can take anywhere from an hour and a half to five hours. Yeah, traffic. So I don't remember how long it took. I really, I don't know. It, it just, it was the longest ride of my life because I still don't think anybody really ever explained to me where I was going or what was happening. Oh, no. They probably said you're going to live with a foster family. Oh. But me, 10 years old, what's a foster family? Right. What's that? Still haven't seen Marilyn. Still haven't seen Linda. I haven't seen biological. I haven't seen anybody. Um, even though... They were at the police precinct when I was brought there, um, or when I was released. I forget which one. But so we got to East Hampton, and I, all I remember are all these trees. And this is actually an inside joke with me and my foster mother to this day, because I had never seen so many trees in all of my life. Growing up up island on Long Island, if you had a tree in your yard, you were royalty. Right. Um, so I remember just all of these trees. And I remember it was dinner time when I got out to my foster parents' house. And the first night, they um, they had pizza for me because they didn't know what time I was going to be getting out there. Right. So they had pizza, and everybody waited. My four siblings that were home at that time, um, my one sister was I'm in away in college. But so my four siblings that were there, my mom and my dad, my foster parents, uh, my mom and my dad, um, had pizza. And then they even had a birthday party for me that first night. Oh, with that's right. Because it was presents and everything. Because it was two days before your birthday that you were kidnapped. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, the awesome thing, the, the most awesome thing that I love about my story 
yeah. is my parents are foster parents. They've been foster parents forever. Um, and they actually, when my story broke, they were actually getting ready to um, get an infant. And my parents were in their early 40s. They had gone through the infant thing. They didn't necessarily want to go back there. But whatever child needed them is who they'd take in. And um, I thought for the longest time that it was my mom that did this, but I found out actually about a year ago that it was my dad. My dad called into social services and told them that when I'm found and when I go into foster care that they want me. Oh, really? So the most awesome thing is knowing I'm sure they had an idea that I was going to be majorly psychologically damaged from this ordeal. But even though through everything, my parents still chose me and said, we want her. We're going to be able to give her what she needs. And they were. And it, it was in a nice neighborhood in uh, the Hamptons, you said? Yes, it was in a lovely, lovely neighborhood. Very safe neighborhood, kids close by. Um, it was awesome. It was awesome growing up there. Well, what was the first week like living there, though? You must have, because you were shy, a shy kid, and you know, but I guess you were so grateful first, to get out of that dungeon and get away from your abusive family, too. Yeah. I think I was upset because I wanted to go live with Marilyn, and if right. you remember from early on in my story, she really wasn't in my life that much, so I wanted to go back and live with her. Um, I didn't know any better. I was 10 years old, wanted to go back to mommy, basically, um, but the first week I remember I my foster mother stayed at home with me we went shopping for sneakers we went shopping for some clothes because I had nothing um friends from my parents church brought clothes by for me um and everything and it was just um I think I started I started therapy pretty quickly um I had meetings with the DA from very very early on um, I wasn't allowed outside because there was media right outside the house. Um, so my parents were trying to protect me. So it was very, like, if I had to go outside to get in the car, it was a very quick process. You, like, running to get in. Um, but my parents did an amazing job at protecting me and keeping me safe and just making me feel that everything was going to be okay. Um, I will say my poor mother... Um, somebody told her that she needs to be careful because I might try to run away. So I truly don't think that for the first year that I was living there that my mother stuck. Oh. <laughs> now, what about when you started going to school? You must have been like a little celebrity there, right? Um, they actually, the day before I started, um, they had an assembly, and basically told the kids that I was going to be starting there and that nobody was to ask me a single question. Aww. So everybody knew who I was um, and nobody asked me anything. And that was awesome to be able to go into school. It was scary. I'm going into a new school, all new kids, don't know anybody. Um, and they put me in, a, in the classroom with my foster brother. So at least like I had somebody that I knew. Right. And um, my fourth grade teacher was amazing. As you can imagine, I was really far behind in school because the first kindergarten, first, second, third, and the first part of fourth grade, I rarely went to. So um, my fourth grade teacher um, helped me out um, whenever I wanted, if I wanted help at recess or after school, absolutely whenever I wanted. And I remember her, um, her older daughter, Katie, actually, um, tutored me in math. Um, so she and I, her daughter and I became friends quickly. Um, and then her husband was my Lassie League softball coach growing up. Um, so I had a really great relationship with my fourth grade teacher and then actually with every teacher there on after. Did you ever visit your, your mom and your step, uh, your godmother? Um, never my godmother. Absolutely not. Um, I had court-mandated visits with my biological mother, and um, at first they were at the DA's office in Riverhead, New York, and then they moved into the Children's Services office up in Ronkonkoma, which was 
quite a hike from where I was. Like, I would have to leave school early. I wouldn't get home until late. And then um, after a while, they moved the visits then back to Riverhead, so I didn't have to drive as far. But I was, on top of going to therapy and going to meetings with the DA, I was also going to court-mandated visits with my biological mother. Um, So it was just craziness, crazy busy schedule of preparing for a trial against Sally Gallery and visiting my biological mother and trying to do homework and trying to be a kid. Right. Um, and then the visits, thankfully, the visits with my biological mother, I think they started off with like one day a week and then went to two days a week and then went to three days a week. And then they died down because it was just way too much. So they took away a day but added an hour to each visit and stuff like that. Um, but I don't really remember there was a lot of visits in the early times that Marilyn wouldn't come to. She just, she would flake. So I would drive to Ronkonkoma or Riverhead with the social service worker, and Marilyn would flake on this visit. So I wasted all this time. So early on in foster care, I had this caseworker, Ginny, who I'm so very, very close with. And um, she would, we would always um, play this game that we would get lost. And we would just drive around. I would tell her, turn left, turn right. And we would end up in, like, the most obscure places because she just felt horrible that I'm taking time out of my day, out of my childhood, to go visit my biological mother. And then, oh, she doesn't show. And she has, she had an excuse for everything. She couldn't get a ride or somebody was sick or she was sick or something. It's just – it's honestly – she just didn't know how to be a mother. Yeah. And that's the, the sad truth of it. Um, and it even showed early on. And I still tried and tried and tried. And then, you know, I just got to the point where I got older and I saw what what happened. And I realized, wow, this is not the person that I want as a mother in my life. And that's when my foster mother became my mother. Now, none of that bunch, the godmother, the mother, the boyfriends, none of them ever got arrested or charged with anything? No. My um, my biological mother, Marilyn, had to go to, like, parenting classes. Oh. Um, and she lost custody of me. She lost custody of me, which was fine. Um, Linda Ingalari, my godmother, she never got charged with anything. The media made her look like a saint. Um because she's the woman who saved me from this hell that I was living in, which she put me in. Um, and it's just, it's sad that she never got charged with anything. Neglect, she never got charged with neglect, truancy, physical yeah. abuse, emotional abuse, um, anything you can imagine. She put me through. Um, but no, she was never charged with anything. The only two people in my childhood that were charged with anything was Sal. Um, he was convicted and he was put in prison. His sentence was four to 12 years. That's right. People should know and, that. Yeah. Child rapists yeah, get he, about an average eight year sentence. They serve an average of three and a half years. Yeah. So, yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but it was, we could only, um, there were only a couple instances where he was able to be convicted on or something like that. Um, and then he was able, actually, I think at his eighth year, he was able to get out, and um, he said no. And then at his tenth year, he was able to get out and said no. And then at his twelfth year, he got out and was on parole. Um, or no, he had to do Megan's Law. He had to participate in Megan's Law because he was a um, level three sex offender. Um and then he violated his Megan's law, and he was found in South Carolina living with some woman who had a kid. Wait a second. We're talking, about es- we're talking about Esposito? No, Inglary. Oh, Inglary. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank God. The Esposito yeah. got life, right? No, yeah, no, he got 15 to life. Um, and his sentence at his, um, goodness gracious, at his 20th year, I think, he died in prison. Okay. Yeah, no, his 21st year, I'm sorry. His 21st year, he died in prison. Yeah, he's another one, though. He probably would have got out in about 25 years, 30 years or something, you know? It's just the, the, the laws, yeah. they, don't, they, they don't take kids into consideration at all. Um, no, and it's, 
I mean, it's sad. And you know what? The laws don't need to look at what happened to one child. The laws need to look at the offender and are they going to repeat again? And I'm sorry. I'm going to say nine and three quarter of a time out of 10, it'll happen again. I, I would say 10 times out of 10 that a sex offender, child rapist will offend again. But you know what? There, there's that little smidge of hope that they won't. But they, they do. Once you've lost that degree, you've lost touch with the, with humanity. You've lost touch with reality that you're actually molesting little kids. You know, you're, you're beyond the, uh, uh, of course you're going to offend again because you've just gone too exactly. far. It's just, you know, yeah. you've lost all, uh, the reasonableness. Okay. Now we got here. What a night. It is, uh, 20 to 7. Okay. Uh, 7 o'clock. We're going to drop a couple of stations. We're going to be dropping Scott Hare. We're going to be dropping, um, uh, that new station we're on. Um, I forget the name of it, but it's a great station. <laughs> we're going to be dropping them. Um, uh, but we're going to be, we can, we're going to go on and take calls and stuff like that, uh, if you want to say, but before we go, uh, and drop these other stations, is there anything you want to leave them with, uh, the, the people before we, uh, lose a couple of stations? I would just say, you know what, you, you all heard what I went through as a child. Um, even though I went through all of that, as an adult, I have not let that define me. And the reason why I have not let my traumas define me is because I had moved to a loving and caring foster home um, that nourished me and loved me and protected me and respected me. Um, but I also, I went through therapy to be able to, deal with everything that I had gone through. I mean, I, ha I have flashbacks to this day. I have little snippets of memories that will come and go. And, you know, to somebody that has not gone through therapy, that might severely affect their daily lives. And I don't allow that to affect me or my life. And part of it is because I've gone through therapy and I learned how to deal with a lot of these instances that would come up as an adult. And that's one of the things that my therapist, Mary, went over is when I was younger, it was the therapy was dealt with dealing with the trial and just kind of like getting over what I had gone through and talking about it and coming to terms with it. And then as I got older, she switched my therapy to being able to deal with as a functioning adult right. so that I wouldn't regress back to being this child. Um, but I would have to say my parents, my foster parents, um, my siblings, my, my four foster siblings, I have to credit my entire recovery to them. Oh, yeah. Because my parents, if they hadn't have come into my life when they did, I would, there's not a chance that I would be where I am. And um, I don't give my foster siblings enough credit. I mean, they they went through a lot. I was a emotionally damaged child. Um, I was emotionally damaged. I was psychologically damaged. Um, and they dealt with a lot growing up, too, with me. And, um, you know, I have such an amazing relationship with them all now. And it's amazing to see where I started off when I moved in with them to where we are now. They're some of my best friends and some of my confidants. And it's all because of them that I'm a functioning adult. Well, did you, were you like a defiant teenager? Were you like a misbehaving, acting out? Um, I wouldn't that, really it? say defiant. I mean, I definitely, I loved my foster parents as any though, like normal teenager would do. Um, my foster parents had a strict rule on dating, so instead of saying I was going out on a date, we would go out with a group of friends, um, right. and then my mom would find out about it, and I would be grounded for a month. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was all just like nor I would say normal, normal high teenage stuff. things. Like I, w okay. yeah, I wasn't really that defiant. Like I'm gonna go do drugs and I'm gonna drink and I'm gonna party and I'm gonna sneak out of the house. I was scared of my parents. So you never, did any, you never had a drug, child, never had a drug be, phase, a drug phase, or drinking phase, or anything like that. Um, I tried marijuana two or three times, and then I was like, "Why does they do this? This is so not for me." 
Um, that was no more than times. And you know what? Part of it was because I was so scared of not only letting my parents down because they had helped me so much, right. but I was also scared of them. And you know what? I'm okay with admitting that I was scared of them, not because they were scary people, not because they ever hit me or anything else, but I just I didn't want to lose their trust. I They had done so much for me that I just, I didn't want to lose it. I had lost so many people in my life that I didn't want to lose them. Um, so no, I think probably my first drink was maybe when I was 18 and it was every now and again. Cause I was like, my mom's going to smell it on me. And I like, <laughs> none of my friends, I was like, don't you come near me. If you're drinking, they'll smell it on me. <laughs> um, so I never really went through that rebellious phase. I think the most rebellious thing that I probably did in high school was I had a serious boyfriend and it took me a little while to tell them. All right. Now, what about yeah. church? Did you get involved in church and become like really religious and strong faith? Um, I was involved in church when I was younger. My foster parents brought us to Sunday school and we went to church. And then um, when we got older, we did youth group on Wednesdays. Right. And I, I loved it. Um, it was fun. I had friends that would go to the same church. And it was it was definitely it was a lot of fun. It was a social experience, and it also was a religious experience for me because, you know, going through what I had gone through, a lot of people are like, "Well, how did you deal? How do you even believe in God?" Well, something helped me through because yeah. I will tell you, it wasn't my childhood. It wasn't the adults in my life. They're the ones that put me there. Um, and I'm truly, as I'm getting older, I'm not as involved in church now that I'm older, which I I should be because my son asks about it. Yeah. Um, but I'm not involved with it now. And um, I'm more now really believing that this is what God intended for my child or from my child. Because there are so many people that aren't strong enough to get up and talk about their traumas or to try to seek help but there are a lot of people that won't even admit what's happening is wrong um there are people that will try to brush out under the rug and i don't want that happening because when i was about eight years old i had actually told linda about what was happening right. and she called me a liar and sent me away so it took me a long time again to then confide in my brother, John, what Alan Galer is doing to me. Um, and I don't want that stigma. I want kids to know that their bodies are their own, and I want to make changes in the world. I want schools to have to teach about good touch and bad touch more than they do because, you know what, you think everybody thinks that the parents are going to teach their kids these things. But it's a lot of the time the parents that are abusing the kids. Yeah, that's the last so thing they want to be talking about, yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't rely on the parents to teach these things. So I think that it really needs to become part of the school curriculum. And um, if nobody's aware, there's actually um, a child abuse victim. Her name is Erin Marin. And... Um, she actually had gone through horrendous abuse when she was a child. She has three books out. I have not yet read them, but I saw her and I know a lot about her story. But she's actually, her life mission is going around the states and passing laws that schools have to teach about um, sex abuse and good touch and bad touch. And I'm a strong supporter of her. Now, what about you? You do speaking engagements too as well, right? Yes, I do speaking engagements right now where I talk about the abuse that I sustained as a child. Um, and mostly um, I talk about how I've recovered. Right. And a, a lot of how I've recovered, how sharing my story. Um, but I just want victims, any victim, PTSD, um, somebody that got into a car accident, somebody that lost their job. Not only abuse victims, but anybody that's been victimized in their life in any way, I want them to know that you can recover with your support system, 
and therapy, that there is a recovery out there. There is, you can move on to some sort of normalcy. And what if somebody wants to get a hold of you to come speak at their event or their group or something like that? How could they find you? Um, you can catch up with me on Facebook. I'm on my husband, who is my social media guru, has me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google+, Plus, um, and then katiebeers.com. Um, if you get on katiebeers.com, you can email me directly or um, you can get me on Facebook, which I think my... Oh, gosh. I think it's Katie Beers is my Facebook and my Twitter and probably my Google Plus account. Yeah, all those links are on the Opperman Report blog. And if you want yes. to get a hold of Katie, just, just get a hold of me and I'll get you in touch with her. <laughs> okay, I'll yes, make sure she flies. But now you're doing something out here with uh, in Vegas where you're going to be speaking at the hostage negotiators thing? Yes, there's um, there's going to be a conference there, a training um, in the end of February. I will be in Las Vegas, and it's the Hostage Negotiator Training Conference. So I will get to add to my ever-growing resume that I can be a course lecturer. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah. Wow, that is very cool. I'm excited. Okay. Hey, listen. So now I'm we're, very excited. Do you want to hang around another hour maybe or a half hour and take some calls? I actually have a five-and-a-half-year-old and a three-and-a-half-year-old that need to get to bed, and probably a husband that needs help doing so. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't get up to bed yet? Oh, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're downstairs watching a movie right now. <laughs> oh. well, it's okay. their Friday night. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Okay, so listen, so we only got about five, uh, five seven minutes yep. left, man. What, what do you want to leave us with? Uh, uh... You know, if, if you're the victim of abuse and – you don't know where to turn to, contact me, email me, message me. Um, if you need help with the direction as to where to go, contact me. Um, if you've told somebody about the abuse and they don't believe you, don't get discouraged. Tell somebody else. Tell somebody, tell somebody until they're going to listen to you. That was part of my problem growing up is, I told a trusted adult they didn't believe me, so I shut down. And I let the abuse go on for at least another year. Um, but now I'm definitely shut from the rooftops. Um, and a big thing is, is you, is if you don't have, if you've gone through a trauma and you don't have a good support system, you need to get a good support system. That is the only way that you are going to recover. You need to weed out the people and get good ones. You know, i tell you something. One thing that was a real blessing in your life is that this did happen to you on Long Island, and then they took you over to the Hamptons, and you had good therapists. Because yes. I tell you, in the rest of the country, yes. they, they don't have good therapy. They don't have good therapists. My daughter's shaking her head right now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and the child protective system in the rest of this country is not like it is uh, back east, you know, in a, in a wealthy no. And you had that good school and those good caring teachers and all that stuff. Thank God. Uh, but, but you must have been praying when you were down in that basement, right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I was in a sort of relief at that point, regardless of what it was, whether I went back and You know, at that point when I was abducted and being held in that dungeon, I would have been happy to go back and look at home because at least I could have fresh air and sunshine. Right. And being able to use the bathroom, um, there were just so many things that I was deprived of that you don't even think about. You're like, oh, this poor little girl locked in this underground basement for 17 days being sexually abused. But that wasn't even the extent of it. I couldn't talk to anybody. Right. I had no sunlight, n nothing, nothing, not, no fresh air. Um, all these things that I was deprived of that are just basic necessities. It's the little things like just being able to walk out your front door, go to the bathroom when you want to do these, yeah. these those little. Yeah, because I, I know a lot of guys that had to go away to prison. I know a lot of guys that came out of prison, you know, and uh, it's you'll you'll lose everything. And I can just imagine when it's being yeah. done. Do you ever have like panic attacks or, and just like if you're in a, like a, a closed room or something like that or on a ride at Disneyland or something? Um, for a long time, for a very long time, um, when I was in foster care, the um, TV TV room and like the hang area was in the basement, and right. so for a long time it was hard for me to hang out down there by myself. Like 
I would go down there if one of my boys were down there or if my mom was down there. And if my brother Jay, if he was done watching TV and he had gone upstairs, before he'd even make up stairs, I'd say, are you coming back? And if he said no, I was going upstairs. And I would ask my mom if she was going to come downstairs. And if she said no, then I would have something else to do. I would not be in that basement by myself. Oh, yeah, I can I can imagine that. Yeah, but now what about as an adult now? Anything now, ever? Never, right? Um, not really, no. Um, yeah. there, there are times that if I see somebody that looks like Esposito or Ingolari, I, can't, like, I kind of do a second look and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then I'm like, okay, number one, they're no longer around. And number two, nobody's going to hurt me. I'm not going to let anybody hurt me. And my husband is one of my biggest protectors. He's there and he does a great job dealing with me. Like around this time of year, um, I was kidnapped on December 28th and I was recovered on January 13th. Oh. So this time of the year is always, always um, just hard for me emotionally and mentally. And it's getting easier as the years go on. It's getting easier. But I can always tell, even though I'm not like, oh, it's that time of year. I could always tell if I'm, like, having a hard time. I take a step back, and I'm like, what is that? Oh, crap, that's what it is. And then once I realize it, I'm over it, and I'm done. But it definitely, it, it stays with you, and it depends how how you look at it and how you react to it. I tell you, thank God you had those foster parents, you know, who, who mm-hmm. became your parents. And thank God you had good therapists yeah. there at good school. That's what that was the big thing here because, uh, oh, my God, I could just imagine. Uh, if, what if, you know, you would have been thrown back with your, your godmother or your mother, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, we were here tonight with Katie Beers, uh, author of the book Buried Memories, My Story. You can get a link to that. On the Opperman Report blog, uh, Katie, I cannot thank you enough uh, for coming on. Your story is just so encouraging. Everybody in the chat room is so excited. Um, mm-hmm. we, we, you're our hero. You really are. We love you. Well, okay. Thank you. And, and thank you so much. And uh, ever you got something you want to promote, just let me know, and we'll put it up on the blog, okay? Definitely great. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Katie. Thanks. Good night. So I just wanted to give um, Scott – and Patty, a chance to, to come on and promote the, their shows and stuff before we get to the break. And then we'll be back. We'll be taking calls. I'll tell some stories about uh, Pete, uh, Pete Stenistrud, my buddy there. Who, uh, I just, uh, I'll tell you some funny stories about him. Okay. Uh, but Scott, what do you have coming up? Uh, this week I have one of your, actually one of your former guests, uh, Gary Stewart and Susan Mustafa will be coming on the show. Ah, very talk- nice. Uh, talking about their book, uh, what's the name of the book? The Most Dangerous Animal of All. Uh, and he's talking about how he believes his father is the Zodiac Killer, which uh, it's very interesting to me because I, I was always very interested in the Zodiac Killer and uh, kind of one of those things where no one's ever figured out who he is and is he still alive and, you know, where is he possibly roaming now. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting it's, it's, It should be an interesting show. Oh, those two are great. I love them. I love, I love, uh, uh, Gary too. Hey, you know what? Ask him about all these girls on his Facebook page, man. Every time I see a pretty girl on Facebook and it says mutual friend, it says mutual friend one, it's always Gary Stewart, man. That guy's, uh, he's got some, uh, group of friends over there. So, Patty, what do you got coming up? Uh, I've got, uh, Turtle Talk, of course, every Monday at, uh, 5 p.m. And uh, then I have um, CST, and then I have uh, Where the Wild Things Grow every Saturday at uh, 3 p.m. CST. So there you go (laughs) on the Awake Radio Network. Sorry about that. (laughs) Ah, Thank you very much. And, Scott, uh, who's coming up after me on uh, Hazy right now? Um, I don't know exactly. There's there's been some uh, some changes in the schedule. I know that I know that uh, the people who are doing who do the show, Clarissa and stuff, they had a death in the family. Right. Um. So I'm not exactly sure who is on. <coughs> well, we keep uh, Clarissa and her family in our prayers, um, and uh, thank her for and I thank you, Scott, for helping out uh, every week like you always do. Uh, no. So no, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate it. all you guys at Hazy are really cool. And Patty again for stepping in here and, and helping us out and. Uh, uh, everything you do for us. Thank you both very, very much. Uh, so when we come back, um, and I hope we get some of our regular callers call in, uh, I, I'd like to tell some stories. Uh, I'll make a couple announcements. You know, I'm going to nag you guys for some money. 
<laughs> again, because, you know, we're just struggling over here so bad, you have no idea. And uh, I'd like to tell some stories about Pete. Uh, Pete uh, Stanistrud actually introduced me to uh, uh, Richard Biegenwald, uh, the serial killer. Uh, so while you're waiting for us to come back from this commercial break, I want you to go to Wikipedia and look up uh, Richard Biegenwald. Okay, and you, you hear that story because that was actually in that house where he had buried those uh, bodies and stuff in, in his front uh, front yard there of his mother's house. Uh, so I guess uh, we're getting toward the end here. Um, where are we here? Uh, how much time we got to go, Patty, before our break? Can we take a break now? Yep, we can go now. Okay, so we'll be right back after this with the Opera Report after show. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Patty. Uh, um, and we'll see you guys right after this. If you're looking for essential oils, stop by and check out Essentially Tammy on Facebook. Uh, she is Young Living Essential Oils Independent Distributor. These 100% therapeutic grade oils help support the body's natural functions. You can click on her website posted on Essentially Tammy, that's T A M I, uh, to see the current deals and check out the benefits of oils such as frankincense, joy, valor, lemon, thieves, panaway, and many more. Email Jocko Tammy, that's J. Uh, Pacific West Bamboo, your number one source for timber, construction, and craft-grade bamboo poles, plants, products, and more. They specialize in eco-friendly reclaimed wood products uh, for the home and garden. They're located in Portland, Oregon, servicing the Northwest for over 10 years. They can be reached at 503-839-8126. That's 503-839-8126. Our Facebook page is Pacific West Bamboo. They can and do ship nationwide, and they're currently getting a new line of bamboo flooring, veneers, and laminates made from Wadawa Bamboo, one of the world's strongest bamboos, grown and produced and manufactured in Central America using only economically and environmentally friendly practices and standards. Hey, don't forget emailrevealer.com. That's my website, emailrevealer.com. And we offer all different kinds of services. Uh, current place of employment locate. Let's say you're trying to locate where your ex-husband or your ex-wife is, uh, is working so you can collect on child support. You contact us. We can locate their place of employment for you and help you collect on that child support. Uh, let's say you think that your husband or your wife is cheating on you. Give us their email address and we can trace it back to online dating uh, websites and uh, dating services. Uh, so we have a multitude of services on email revealers. They're in Guerrero, Mexico. They want their men to come back. So they've written these beautiful love letters, and they've put them all in this beautiful coffee table book. Uh, first, the letters are written in Spanish, handwritten. You can see pictures of the people writing the books. And then it comes up. 